A dive bomber is a bomber aircraft that dives directly at its targets in order to provide greater accuracy for the bomb it drops. Diving towards the target simplifies the bomb's trajectory and allows the pilot to keep visual contact throughout the bomb run. This allows attacks on point targets and ships, which were difficult to attack with conventional level bombers, even en masse. Glide bombing is a similar technique using shallower dive angles that does not require a sharp pull up after dropping the bombs. This can be performed by larger aircraft and fighter bombers but does not confer the same level of accuracy as a steep dive from a dedicated aircraft. Definition A dive bomber dives at a steep angle, normally between 45 and 60 degrees or even up to a near vertical dive of 80 degrees with Ju-87, and thus requires an abrupt pull up after dropping its bombs. This puts great strains on both pilot and aircraft. It demands an aircraft of strong construction with some means to slow its dive. This limited the class to light bomber designs with ordnance loads in the range of 1,000 pounds, 450 kilograms, although there were larger examples. The most famous examples are the Junkers Ju-87 Stuka, which was widely used during the opening stages of World War II, the Aichi D-3A Val dive bomber, which sank more Allied warships during the war than any other Axis aircraft, and the Douglas SBD Dauntless which sank more Japanese shipping than any other Allied aircraft type. The SBD Dauntless helped win the Battle of Midway, was instrumental in the victory at the Battle of the Coral Sea, and fought in every U.S. battle involving carrier aircraft. An alternative technique, glide bombing, allowed the use of heavier aircraft, which faced far greater difficulties in recovering from near-vertical approaches and allowed greater use of sophisticated bomb sites and aiming techniques by a specialized member of air crews, namely a bombardier slash bomber mayor. The crews of multi-engine dive bombers, such as variants of the Junkers Ju-88 and Pet Lyakov PE-2, frequently used this technique. The heaviest aircraft to have dive bombing included in its design and development, the four-engined Heinkel He-177, also utilized a glide bombing approach. The requirement that the He-177 be able to dive slash glide bomb delayed its development and impaired its overall performance. Dive bombing was most widely used before and during World War II, its use declined during the war, when its vulnerability to enemy fighters became apparent. In the post-war era, this role was replaced with a combination of improved and automated bomb sites, larger weapons and even nuclear warheads that greatly reduced the need for accuracy and finally by precision-guided weapons as they became available in the 1960s. Most tactical aircraft today allow bombing in shallow dives to keep the target visible, but true dive bombers have not been a part of military forces since the start of the jet age. Bombing Accuracy Horizontal Bombing When released from an aircraft, a bomb carries with it the aircraft's velocity. In the case of a bomber flying horizontally, the bomb will initially only be traveling forward. This forward motion is opposed by the drag of the air, so the forward motion decreases over time. Additionally, gravity causes the bomb to accelerate after it is dropped. The combination of these two forces, drag and gravity, results in a complex pseudo-parabolic trajectory. The distance that the bomb moves forward while it falls is known as its range. If the range for a given set of conditions is calculated, simple trigonometry can be used to find the angle between the aircraft and the target. By setting the bomb site to this range angle, the aircraft can time the drop of its bombs at the instant when the target is lined up in the site. This was only effective for area bombing, however, since the path of the bomb is only roughly estimated. Large formations could drop bombs on an area hoping to hit a specific target but there was no guarantee of success, and huge areas around the target would also be hit. The advantage to this approach, however, was that it is easy to build such an aircraft and fly it at high altitude, keeping it out of range of ground-based defenses. The horizontal bomber was thus ill-suited for tactical bombing, particularly in close support. Attempts at using high-altitude bombing in near proximity to troops often ended in tragedy, with bombs both hitting their targets and friendly troops indiscriminately. In attacking shipping, the problems of inaccuracy were amplified by the fact that the target could be moving, 
and could change its direction between the time that the bombs were released and the time that they arrived. Successful strikes on marine vessels by horizontal bombers were extremely rare. An example of this problem can be seen in the attempts to attack the Japanese carriers using B-17S and B-26S at altitude early in the Battle of Midway, with no hits scored. The German battleship Tirpitz was subjected to countless attacks, many while in dock and immobile, but was not sunk until the British brought an enormous 12,000 pounds, 5,400 kilograms, tall boy bombs to ensure that even a near miss would be effective. Dive Bombing An aircraft diving vertically minimizes its horizontal velocity component. When the bomb is dropped, the force of gravity simply increases its speed along its nearly vertical trajectory. The bomb travels a virtually straight line between release and impact, eliminating the need for complex calculations. The aircraft simply aims at the target and releases its bombs. The primary source of error is the effect of wind on the bomb's flight path after release. As bombs are streamlined and heavy, wind has only a slight effect on them and the bomb is likely to fall within its lethal radius of the target. Bomb sighting becomes trivial requiring only a straight line of sight to the target. This was simplified as the aircraft was pointed directly at the target, making sighting over the nose much easier. Differences in the path of different bombs due to differing ballistics can be corrected by selecting a standardized bombing altitude and then adjusting the dive angle slightly for each case. As the bomber dives, the aim could be continually adjusted. In contrast, when a horizontal bomber veers offline while approaching the bomb release point, turning to the angle that would correct this also changes the speed of the aircraft over the ground, when there is a wind, and thereby changes the range as well. In the 1930s and early 1940s, dive bombing was the best method for attacking high-value compact targets, like bridges and ships, with accuracy. The forces generated when the aircraft levels out at the bottom of the dive are considerable. The drawback of modifying and strengthening an aircraft for near-vertical dives was the loss of performance. Aside from the greater strength requirements, during normal horizontal flight, aircraft are normally designed to return to fly straight and level, but when put into a dive the changes in forces affecting the aircraft now cause the aircraft to track across the target unless the pilot applies considerable force to keep the nose down, with a corresponding decrease in accuracy. To compensate, Many dive bombers were designed to be trimmed out, either through the use of special dive flaps, such as Ferry Youngman flaps, or through changes in tailplane trim that must be readjusted when the dive is completed. The Volte Vengeance, mostly used by the RAF and RAF in Burma, was designed to be trimmed for diving, with no lift to distort the dive. The drawback was that it flew nose up in level flight, increasing drag. Failure to readjust trim made the aircraft difficult or impossible to pull out of a dive. A dive bomber was vulnerable to low-level ground fire as it dived towards its target, since it was often headed in a straight line directly towards the defenders. At higher levels, this was less of a problem, as larger AA, anti-aircraft, shells were fused to explode at specific altitudes, which is impossible to determine while the plane is diving. In addition, most higher altitude gunners and gunnery systems were designed to calculate the lateral movement of a target, while diving, the target appears almost stationary. Also, many AA mounts lacked the ability to fire directly up, so dive bombers were almost never exposed to fire from directly ahead. Dive brakes were employed on many designs to create drag which slowed the aircraft in its dive and increased accuracy. Air brakes on modern aircraft function in a similar manner in bleeding off excessive speed. History Origins It is difficult to establish how dive bombing came into being. During World War I, the Royal Flying Corps on the Western Front found its biplane two-seat bombers insufficiently accurate. Commanders urged pilots to dive from their cruising altitude to under 500 feet, 150 m, to have a better chance of hitting small targets such as gun emplacements and trenches. As this exposed the aircraft and crew to destructive ground fire in their unprotected open cockpits, few chose to follow this order. Some recorded altitude at the top and bottom of their dive in logbooks and squadron records, but not the steepness of the dive. It was certainly not near vertical, 
as these early aircraft could not withstand the stresses of a sustained vertical dive. The Royal Naval Air Service was bombing the Zeppelin sheds in Germany and occupied Belgium and found it worthwhile to dive onto these sheds to ensure a hit, despite the increased casualties from ground fire. The angle of dive in these attacks was again not recorded. Beginning on June 18, 1918, the Royal Air Force, formerly the Royal Flying Corps, ordered large numbers of the SOP with TF.2 Salamander, a single-seat biplane. The TF stood for trench fighter, and the aircraft was designed to attack German trenches with both Vickers.303 machine guns and 25 pounds, 11 kilograms, bombs. Of the 37 salamanders produced before the end of October 1918, only two were delivered to France, and the war ended before those planes saw action. Whether the salamander should be considered in more modern parlance as a fighter bomber or a dive bomber again depends on the definition of dive. It had armored protection for the pilot and fuel system to attack at low level but lacked dive brakes for a vertical dive. Heavy casualties produced by air-to-ground attack on trenches set the minds of senior officers in the newly created Royal Air Force against dive bombing. So not until 1934 did the Air Ministry issue specifications for both land-based and carrier-based dive bombers. The RAF cancelled their requirement and relegated the Hawker Henley dive bomber to other roles while the fleet air arms Blackburn Skua was expected to do double duty, as a fighter when out of reach of land-based fighter support, and as a dive bomber. It had dive brakes that doubled as flaps for carrier landings. The Hawker Henley had a top speed only 50 miles per hour, 80 kilometers per hour, slower than the Hawker Hurricane fighter from which it was derived. The American and Japanese navies and the Luftwaffe chose vertical dive bombers whose low speed had dire consequences when they encountered modern fighters. World War I The Royal Naval Air Service developed dive bombing as a tactic against Zeppelin hangars and formed and trained a squadron at Manchester for this task. On October 8, 1914, a SOP with tabloid with 250 pounds, 23 kilograms, bombs attacked a hangar at Dusseldorf after a dive to 600 feet, 180 m. On November 14, 1914, four Avro 504s attacked the Zeppelin factory at Friedrichshafen on Lake Constance, diving from 1,200 feet, 370 m, to 500 feet, 150 m, to ensure hits. As Zeppelins were tethered close to stores of hydrogen, Results were often spectacular. The first use of dive bombing by the Royal Flying Corps, which had been urging its pilots to drop bombs at heights below 500 feet, 150 m, in order to hit within 150 feet, 46 m, of the target since February 1915, was later that year. On November 27, 1915, Lieutenant Duncan Grinnell Milne arrived in his Royal Aircraft Factory B.E.2C over railway marshalling yards near Lys in northern France, to find the target already crowded by other bombers. He dived from 10,000 feet, 3,000 m, to 2,000 feet, 610 m, before releasing his 20 pounds, 9.1 kilograms, bombs. A few weeks later, Lieutenant Arthur Gould dived to just 100 feet. 30m, to hit buildings near Arras. The Royal Flying Corps developed strafing with diving aircraft using both machine guns and small bombs as a deliberate tactic. At the Battle of Cambrai on November 20, 1917, 320 Mark IV tanks and 300 aircraft, mostly SOP with camels and Airco DH-5s with 20 pounds, 9.1 kilograms, bombs, were used to suppress artillery and machine guns. The cost in pilots was very high, with casualties on some days reaching 30%. The Sopwith Salamander was developed as the first dedicated ground attack fighter. Based on the Sopwith Snipe it had 600 pounds, 270 kilograms, of armor in the front end to protect the pilot and fuel against ground fire. While 1,400 were ordered, only two were delivered to France before the armistice. Only 500 were produced. The initial impact at Cambrai was highly successful. 
the staff officer to the Royal Tank Corps Lt. Col. J.F.C. Fuller published findings which were later taken up by Heinz Guderian to form the basis for the blitzkrieg tactics of using dive bombers with tanks employed by the Germans in 1939-40. Second Lt. William Henry Brown a Canadian from British Columbia serving with the RFC and flying a Royal Aircraft Factory S.E.5A, made the first attack on a vessel on March 14, 1918 destroying an ammunition barge on a canal at Bernat near St. Quentin, diving to 500 feet, 150 m, to release his bombs. He was awarded the Military Cross for this and other exploits. Brown's technique was emulated by other British squadrons. But the heavy casualties to unprotected pilots cast a pall over the results and influenced RAF thinking for 20 years. Interwar Era The Royal Flying Corps was initially impressed with the potential of the dive bomber, but was aware of its suicidal nature. It ran a series of tests at the Armament Experimental Station at Orfordness in Suffolk. SOP with Camels and Royal Aircraft Factory S.E.5 as were used in early 1918 to dive bomb targets from various heights, with different bombs and with and without the use of the Aldous gun sight, which had been invented in 1916 to aid pilots to calculate the deflection required to hit a traversing German plane. In principle, it obviated the need for a vertical dive. The results showed that a vertical dive into the wind sighting along the top of rather than through the sight was best but they were not considered good enough to justify the expected casualties. The Royal Air Force, which took over both Army and Naval Aviation in April 1918, retired its SOP with Salamander dive bombers at the end of the war. Colonel, later General, Billy Mitchell arrived in France with the 1st U.S. Army and Air Force units soon after April 6, 1917 and began to organize the U.S. Army Air Force flying French Samson II's, a spotter plane. The later Samson 4 was to be a ground attack and dive bomber, but production was cancelled at the end of the war. Mitchell became a strong advocate of dive bombers after witnessing British and French aerial attacks. Mitchell by now Assistant Chief of the Air Service United States Army arranged tests with captured German and obsolete U.S. ships in June and July 1921 and repeated over the next two years using Royal Aircraft Factory S.E.5 as as dive bombers and Handley Page O-400S and Martin NBS-1S as level bombers carrying bombs of different weights up to 2,000 pounds, 910 kilograms. The SMS Ostfriesland was sunk and so later were the USS Alabama, USS Virginia, and USS New Jersey. Opposite conclusions were drawn by the RAF and USAS, from two very different tests regarding the usefulness of dive bombers, with the RAF concluding that the cost in pilots was too high to justify the results and the USAS considering it as a potent anti-ship weapon. Both naval staffs opposed the view taken by the respective airmen. In 1919, United States Marine Corps pilot Lt. L. H. Sanderson mounted a rifle in front of the windshield of his Curtis JN-4, a training aircraft, as an improvised bomb site, loaded a bomb in a canvas bag attached to the plane's underside, and made a solo attack in support of U.S. Marines trapped by Hadians during the United States occupation of Haiti. Sanderson's bomb hit its target and the raids were repeated. During 1920, Sanderson familiarized aviators of USMC units on the Atlantic coast with dive bombing techniques. Dive bombing was also used during the United States occupation of Nicaragua. As aircraft grew more powerful, dive bombing became a favored tactic particularly against small targets such as ships. The US Navy overcame its hostility to Mitchell's findings and deployed the Curtis F-8C Falcon biplane from 1925 on carriers while the Marine Corps operated them from land bases as the Hell Diver, a name later reused by Curtis for other dive bombers. The Imperial Japanese Navy ordered the Heinkel He-50 in 1931 as a float plane and carrier-based dive bomber and embarked some on new carriers from 1935 in a developed form as the Heinkel He-66, from which the Aichi D-1A was further developed in Japan. The Luftwaffe confiscated a Chinese export shipment and ordered more. Navy's increasingly operated carriers, which had a limited number of aircraft available for attack, each with only a small bomb load. Targets were often likely to be a small or fast moving and the need for accuracy made dive bombers essential. Ernst Houdet, 
a German First World War ace, persuaded Hermann Göring to buy two Curtis Hawk IIS for the newly reformed Luftwaffe. Udet, then a stunt pilot, flew one in aerobatic displays during the 1936 Berlin Olympic Games. Due to his connections with the Nazi Party, he became the development director of the Ministry of Aviation, Nazi Germany, where he pushed for dive bomber development. Dive bombing would allow a low-cost Luftwaffe to operate effectively in the tactical role. Against small targets, a single-engine dive bomber could achieve four times the accuracy at one-tenth of the cost of a four-engine heavy bomber, such as the projected Ural bomber, and it could reach the battlefield well ahead of field artillery. Soon the Luftwaffe issued a contract for its own dive bomber design, resulting in the Junkers K-47, which, following extensive trials, would in turn result in the gull-winged Junkers Ju-87 Stuka, a contraction of Sturtkamp Flugsjug, literally diving combat airplane. Several early Junkers Ju-87 dive bombers, which first flew in on September 13, 1935, were shipped secretly from Germany to Spain to assist General Francisco Franco's nationalist rebels in the Spanish Civil War. Several problems appeared, including the tendency of the fixed undercarriage to sink into soft ground and an inability to take off with a full bomb load. Condor Legion experience in Spain demonstrated the value of dive bombers especially on the morale of troops or civilians unprotected by air cover. The aircraft did not encounter opposing modern fighters, which concealed from the Luftwaffe its vulnerability. Houdet was impressed with the Stuka's performance in Spain, so he ordered that the Junkers Ju-88 medium bomber should also be retrofitted as a dive bomber. This required some 50,000 modifications, increasing its weight by 5 tons and reducing speed by 120 miles per hour, 190 kilometers per hour. He also insisted, against the advice of Ernst Heinkel, that the Heinkel He-177 bomber, ordered in November 1937, be able to dive bomb. Lack of a sufficiently powerful, reliable power plant fatally compromised its utility, it never performed in the dive bomber role, and the requirement was eventually dropped. Some 23 Breda BA-65s were flown by Italian pilots also in support of nationalist forces. First flown in 1935, it was a single-seat dive bomber carrying the same bomb load as the Stuka with a 30 miles per hour, 48 kilometers per hour, speed advantage in level flight. As the Royal Navy again took control of the fleet air arm, it began to receive the ferry swordfish from 1936 and Blackburn skuas from November 1938. The skua had a secondary function of intercepting attacks by unescorted long-range bombers. With four 0.303 Browning guns and another rear-facing, it was expected to defend against air attack with a top speed of 225 miles per hour, 362 kilometers per hour, at sea level, which was a comparable low-altitude speed with other Navy's carrier-borne fighters in 1938-39. The Swordfish was also capable of operating as a dive bomber and in 1939 HMS Glorious used her Swordfish for a series of dive bombing trials, during which 439 practice bombs were dropped at dive angles of 60, 67, and 70 degrees against the target ship HMS Centurion. Tests against a stationary target showed an average error of 49YD, 45M, from a release height of 1,300 feet, 400M, and a dive angle of 70 degrees. Tests against a maneuvering target showed an average error of 44YD, 40M, from a drop height of 1,800 feet, 550M, and a dive angle of 60 degrees. The ferry Albacore was also designed to act as a dive bomber and was used extensively in this role during World War II. The British Air Ministry issued a specification 434th in 1934 for a ground attack aircraft with dive bombing capability. The Hawker Henley was a two-seat version of the Battle of Britain winning Hawker Hurricane. It was fast at almost 300 miles per hour, 480 kilometers per hour, at sea level and 450 miles per hour. 720 km per hour, in a dive, but development was delayed when hurricane development took priority. Just 200 were built and it was relegated to target towing. 
The RAF ordered the US built Volte A31 Vengeance in 1943, but it too was similarly relegated to target towing after a brief operation period in secondary theaters. The Curtis SBC Hell Diver was a biplane dive bomber that had been taken aboard the USS Yorktown, CV-5, in 1934, but it was slow at 234 miles per hour, 377 kilometers per hour. Fifty excess Navy examples were flown to Halifax, Nova Scotia by Curtis pilots and embarked on the French aircraft carrier Bairn in a belated attempt to help France, which surrendered whilst they were mid-Atlantic. Five airframes left behind in Halifax later reached the RAF, who quickly relegated them to the status of ground instructional airframes for the training of mechanics. The Japanese introduced the Aichi D-3A VAL monoplane as a successor to the biplane Aichi D-1A in 1940 with trials aboard the carriers Kaga and Akaji. It was to prove a potent weapon against surface ships. Only the Wehrmacht learned from the Battle of Cambrai, 1917 and using dive bombers in conjunction with tanks. The writings of Colonel J. F. C. Fuller a staff officer and Basil Liddell Hart a military journalist propounded the concept of mobile tank forces supported by ground attack aircraft creating a breakthrough. These were eagerly studied by Heinz Guderian, who created the combination of Panzers and Junkers Ju 87s that proved so potent in Poland and France. The Stuka could be used as aerial artillery moving far ahead of the main forces with panzers to smash enemy strong points without waiting for the horse-drawn artillery to catch up. It was central to the concept of Blitzkrieg which required close coordination between aircraft and tanks by radio. The RAF had chosen the single-engined ferry battle and the twin-engined Bristol Blenheim as its tactical bombers. Both were level bombers with similar bomb loads and entered service in 1937. The U.S. Army Air Corps, USAC, adopted the Douglas Havoc, first flying in January 1939, for a similar role, although originally ordered by France. Many were also supplied to the Soviet Air Force, which also used the Ilyushin Il-2 Sturmovik ground attack aircraft in huge numbers. None of these were dive bombers. No Allied Air Force operated a modern dive bomber at the outbreak of the Second World War although both the Royal Navy and the U.S. Navy had shipboard dive bombers. World War II European Theater On April 10, 1940, 16 Blackburn skuas flying at extreme range from the Naval Air Station at Hatston, Orkney led by Lt. Commander William Lucy sank the German cruiser Königsberg in Bergen Harbor, whilst trying to prevent the German invasion of Norway. On the German side Stukas augmented or replaced artillery support for their lightly armed parachute and airborne troops. The invasion of Poland and the Battle of France saw the Stuka used to devastating effect. German blitzkrieg tactics utilized dive bombers in place of artillery to support highly mobile ground troops. The British Expeditionary Force had set up strong defensive positions on the west bank of the Waz River to block rapidly advancing German armor. Stukas quickly broke the defenses and a crossing was forced long before German artillery arrived. On December 13, May 1940, Stukas flew 300 sorties against strong French defensive positions at the Battle of Sedan. This enabled German forces to make a fast and unexpected breakthrough of the French lines, eventually leading to the German advance to the Channel and the cutting off of much of the Allied army. The skies over Sedan also showed the Stukas' weakness when met with fighter opposition, Six French Curtis H-75s attacked a formation of unescorted Ju-87s and shot down 11 out of 12 without loss. The Stuka was even more vulnerable to the Hawker Hurricane with its 100 miles per hour, 160 km per hour, speed edge and eight machine guns, which it first met over France and then in larger numbers in the Battle of Britain. Losses were such that it was rapidly withdrawn from operations over the United Kingdom. A similar fate befell unescorted RAF ferry battles over France. The Stuka had 7.92mm machine guns or 20mm cannons mounted in the wings. Some were modified to destroy tanks with heavy caliber, 37mm board Canona BK 3,7 auto cannons mounted in gun pods below the wings. They were very successful in this role in the early days of Operation Barbarossa before the Red Army Air Force countered with modern fighters such as the Yakovlev Yak-1 and later Yakovlev Yak-3. 
The most successful dive bomber pilot was Hans Ulrich Rudel who made 2,530 sorties. He sank the Soviet battleship Mara at Kronstadt on September 23, 1941 using 1,000 pounds, 450 kilograms, bombs. Later, using a tank buster Stuka with 20 mm cannon, he claimed over 100 Soviet tanks destroyed, mostly at the Battle of Kursk in July 1943. The Ju 87G cannon and Vogel equipped with two 37 mm BK 3,7 anti tank guns, as suggested by Rudel, proved to be a lethal weapon in skilled hands. In the Soviet counter offensive, Operation Kutuzov, which concluded Kursk, the Luftwaffe claimed 35 tanks destroyed in a single day. Rudel CO wrote a post war book about his experiences and consulted with the U.S. Air Force. When Italy joined the war on the Axis side, Breda BA 65s were shipped to North Africa for use against the British, but they also proved vulnerable. By February 1941, most had been shot down by British fighters. In Morocco on November 11, 1942, American Curtis P 40 Warhawks shot down 15 Ju 87DS in one encounter. The United States Army Air Force took delivery of a few North American Mustangs from a British order, but as there were no funds to buy more fighters, they were modified as dive bombers with a new wing and dive brakes. First flown in October 1942 as the North American A-36 Apache, they arrived in Morocco in April 1943 to assist with driving the Africa Corps out of Africa. The aircraft was very fast at low altitude. Sadly, it was also accident-prone achieving the highest casualty rate during training of any USAF aircraft and was officially restricted to no more than a 70-degree dive. The Apache did not fly with the RAF, but served with US squadrons in Sicily, Italy and, by late summer of 1943, was based in India for use over Burma and China. It proved to be an excellent dive bomber and a good fighter, creating one ace in Italy who shot down five German fighters. The Royal Navy's Ferry Swordfish and Albacore Torpedo Dive Bombers and Blackburn Skua Dive Bombers were replaced by Ferry Barracuda Torpedo Dive Bombers, which made repeated diving attacks on the German battleship Tirpitz which lay protected by torpedo nets in a Norwegian fjord, during 1944. On April 3, 1944, in Operation Tungsten, 42 aircraft flying from the carriers HMS Victorious and HMS Furious scored 14 hits with 500 pounds, 230 kilograms, and 1,600 pounds, 730 kilograms, bombs and put the battleship out of action for over two months. Pacific Theater The Volte Vengeance was developed in the U.S. as a private venture dive bomber for export. It first flew in March 1941. It had a zero incidence wing, which was perfect for vertical dives as there was no lift from wing or tailplane in a dive. But it had to fly in a nose up attitude to maintain level flight, which made landings difficult. Initial orders were 300 for France, but France fell before they could be delivered. The RAF, with the cancellation of the Hawker Henley and having noted the success of Stukas in Poland, took delivery instead. It was considered too vulnerable to German fighters for use in Europe or North Africa, but large numbers flew in Burma from March 1943. It flew close support for General William Slim's Burma campaign bombing Japanese supply routes, bridges and artillery. It operated in the Royal Australian Air Force, Indian Air Force as well as the RAF. Some were held back for the United States Army Air Force after the attack on Pearl Harbor, but did not see combat. Both the Imperial Japanese Navy, IJN, and the United States Navy invested considerable effort on dive bombers. Japan started the war with a very good design, the Please subscribe and thanks for watching.